Chapter 39 Bakari heard the sudden rush of feet and turned too late. The younger ranger was upon him before he could make any attempt at evasion. He felt hands grip the front of his jacket and lift him to his feet. The young face was thrust close to his. Grey with fatigue, eyes red-rimmed, Will found renewed energy in the sudden burst of hatred he felt for this sneering killer. Malcolm started to scramble to his feet to stop him, but he was too late. You forget! You forget! Will's voice rose to a shout as he shook the Genovesan like a rat. He shoved him away violently. Bikari, his hands and feet securely tied, staggered, stumbled and fell grunting with pain as he landed awkwardly on his side. Then the hands were upon him again, and he was dragged to his feet once more. Then you'd better remember, Will shouted, and sent him staggering and falling again with another shove. This time, Bakari fell close to the fire so that his left side was actually in the outer embers. He cried out in pain as he felt the glowing coals burn through his sleeve and begin to sear into the flesh. Will! It was Malcolm, attempting to intervene, but Will shook him off. He grabbed the Genovesan by the feet and heaved him clear of the fire. As he reached for his feet, Bakari tried to kick out at him, but Will easily avoided the clumsy attempt. He lashed out in reply, the tip of his boot catching Bakari in the thigh, bringing another grunt of pain from the Genovesan. Stop it, Will! Malcolm shouted. He could see that the situation was escalating. Will, exhausted physically and emotionally, wasn't thinking clearly. He was on the brink of a terrible mistake. As Malcolm had the thought, he saw the ranger's hand drop to the hilt of his sax knife. With his left hand, Will pulled the struggling assassin to his feet once more, holding him so that their faces were only centimetres apart. Now Bakari recognised that blind rage as well and realised that he had pushed the matter too far. This grey-cloaked stranger was quite capable of killing him. He had miscalculated badly. He had forced him into this killing fury. But still... He realised that his only hope for survival lay in not telling them what they wanted to know. So long as he held the key to their friend's survival, they couldn't kill him. He felt the tip of the sax knife now against his throat. The face, so close to his, was distorted with grief and rage. Start remembering! White or blue? Which one? Tell us! Tell us! Then Bakari saw a large hand descend onto the ranger's shoulder. Horace gently but firmly pulled Will back from the edge of the killing madness that had overcome him. Will, take it easy. There's a better way. Will turned to his friend, his eyes brimming now with tears of frustration and fear. Fear for Holt, lying so silently while this, this creature knew the secret that could save him. Horace, he said, his voice breaking as he appealed to his friend for help. Will had done all he possibly could, and it had come to nothing. Bone-weary, totally exhausted, he had found the strength to trail this man for hour after hour. He had fought him, defeated him, and captured him. He had brought him back here. And now, Bakari sneered at them, and refused to tell them which poison he had used. It was too much. Will could think of nothing further to do, no further avenue to explore. But Horace could. He met his friend's desperate gaze and nodded reassuringly. Then gently, he disengaged Will's hands from Bakari's jerkin. Dumbly, Will complied and stepped back. Then Horace smiled at Bakari. He turned him round and reached down to seize the cuff of his right sleeve in both hands. With a quick jerk, he tore the material for about 15 centimetres, exposing the flesh of the man's inside forearm and the veins there. Bakari, his hands still fastened behind his back, 
twisted desperately to see what Horace was doing. His face was contorted now in a worried frown. Horace wasn't raging or ranting at him. He was calm and controlled. That worried the Genovesean more than Will's shouting. Horace reached for the quiver still hanging from Bakari's belt. There were four or five bolts left in it. He withdrew one and inspected the tip. The gummy substance that Malcolm had indicated before could be seen on the sharpened iron point of this bolt as well. Horace held the bolt before Bakari's eyes, letting him see the poison so there could be no mistake. At that moment, Bakari realised what Horace had in mind. He started to struggle desperately, trying to loosen his bonds. But the thumb cuffs held him fast, and Horace's grip on his right arm was like a vice. The young warrior put the razor-sharp tip of the bolt against Bakari's inner forearm, then deliberately pressed it into the flesh, penetrating deeply so that hot blood sprang from the wound and ran down Bakari's hands. Bakari screamed in pain and fear as Horace dragged the sharpened iron through the flesh of his arm, opening a deep, long cut. Now, Bakari could feel the blood pumping out in a regular stream. Horace had found a vein with the bolt. That meant the poison would penetrate the Genovese's bloodstream and system much faster than it had done with the glancing scratch on Holt's arm. No! No! the assassin screamed, trying to break free. But he knew it was already too late. The poison was in him, already beginning to spread, and he knew what was in store. He had seen his victims die before, many times. He stopped struggling and his knees sagged, but Horace held him firmly, keeping him standing. The young warrior tossed the crossbow bolt aside and looked around at his two friends, seeing the shock on their faces as they realised what he had done. Then he saw the expression on Will's face change to one of satisfied approval. Malcolm was a different matter. He was a healer dedicated to saving life and Horace's action went against all his basic principles. He could never bring himself to intentionally put a life in danger the way Horace had done. Malcolm, Horace was saying, the more the victim moves about and exerts himself, the faster the poison will spread through his system. Is that right? Wordless, Malcolm nodded confirmation. Good, Horace said. He let go of Bakari's arm and tore the already ripped sleeve free. Then, working quickly, he wrapped it firmly around the bleeding wound in the Genovese's arm. Can't have you bleeding to death before the poison kills you, he said. He finished tying the makeshift bandage and released his grip on the Genovese. Bakari, horrified at what had happened to him, sank slowly to his knees, head bowed. He looked to Malcolm, saw his only possible source of survival, and pleaded with the healer. Please, I beg you, don't let him do this. Malcolm shrugged unhappily. The matter was out of his hands. Horace stooped swiftly and removed the ankle cuffs that secured Bakari. Then the assassin felt that powerful grip under his arm again as he was hauled to his feet. Up you come, my murdering friend. Can't have you sitting around all day. We're going to walk. We're going to run. We're going to get that poison just racing through you. And so saying, he began to propel Bakari before him, forcing the Genovesean into an awkward, shambling trot. They crossed the little copse, leaving the shelter of the trees. Horace pointed to the southern ridge. What do you say we go admire the view from up there, he said. Sounds like a plan. Then let's go. With Horace holding the prisoner firmly by the elbow, they began to trot up the slope. Then he increased the pace so that they were running. Bakari slipped and fell half a dozen times, but on each occasion, Horace would drag him to his feet and get him running once more. 
Will and Malcolm could hear Horace's sarcastic exhortations as he drove Bakari to greater and greater efforts. Come on, my old Genovesean runner, up you come. On your feet, poison peddler. Move it along, we have to keep that poison spreading. Gradually, the voice faded away as the two figures ran awkwardly up the slope, one half dragging the other. Malcolm met Will's eyes. Will could see the disapproval there. Can you stop him? the healer asked. Will looked coldly at him. Perhaps I could, but why would I? Malcolm shook his head and turned away. Will moved to him and touched his shoulder, turning the healer back to face him again. Malcolm, I think I understand. I know you find it hard to condone this, but it has to be done. The little man shook his head unhappily. It goes against everything I've ever done and believed, Will. The idea of deliberately infecting a healthy body, of putting poison into it, it's it's just wrong for me. Perhaps it is, Will conceded, but it's Holt's only chance. You know that creature was never going to tell us which poison he used. No matter how much we threatened him, he didn't believe we'd follow through on the threats. And he was probably right. I couldn't put a knife to his throat and simply kill him if he refused to answer. So this is different? Malcolm asked, and Will nodded. Of course it is. This way, the choice is up to him. If he tells us which poison he used, you can counteract it. You've said yourself the antidote will be effective almost immediately. This way, we're not killing him. We're here to save him, and if he dies, it will be his choice. Malcolm lowered his eyes. There was a long silence between them. You're right, he said at length. I don't like it, but I can see there is a difference, and it's necessary. They heard the sound of thudding footsteps coming back down the hill. Then Horace led a white-faced, shuffling Bakari into the clearing among the trees. There was an unmistakable expression of grim satisfaction on Horace's face. Guess what, he said. Our friend has his memory back. The poison was derived from the white Araquina. Bakari babbled the information to Malcolm, his eyes wide with fear. Malcolm nodded and hurried to fetch his medical kit. He rummaged inside it and produced half a dozen small containers of liquids and sacks of powder. Hastily, he began measuring and mixing, and within five minutes had a thin, yellow liquid prepared. He took the bowl containing the liquid and moved to Holt's side. No, Will said, gesturing to the bowl. Not Holt. Give it to Bakari first. At first, Malcolm was surprised by the statement. Then he saw the reasoning behind it. There was still the chance that the Genovesean had deceived them about the poison. If he saw that he was about to be given the wrong antidote, the antidote that could kill him, he would have to tell them. But the killer looked quickly at Will as he heard the words and stepped forward, trying to twist so that his wounded arm, still tied behind his back, was closer to the healer. Yes, yes, he said, give it to me now. Horace had been right. The fact that he had penetrated a vein with the poison meant that it was working far more quickly on the Genovesean than it had on Holt. Already, Bakari could feel the heat in his injured arm, the burning pain of the poison. And he could feel it moving up the arm as well. His pulse was starting to race, another side effect of the poison, and he knew that would force the venom around his system even more quickly. Malcolm looked at him, glanced at Will, and nodded. Holt was safe for the time being, and it would take only minutes to administer the antidote to Bakari. He gestured to the man's arm. Untie him, please, Will, he said. I need to get at that arm. Will reached behind the Genovesean and undid the thumb cuffs. As he did so, he dropped his hand warningly to the hilt of his sax knife. Remember, 
We don't need you alive any longer. Be very careful in all your movements. Bakari nodded and dropped eagerly beside where Malcolm was kneeling. He stretched out his arm for treatment, gasping in alarm as Malcolm removed the bandage and he could see the banded, discoloured flesh of his inside forearm. With the pressure of the constricting bandage removed, the arm was swollen badly. Malcolm took the injured arm, studied it for a moment, then turned it so that the inner part faced upwards. He had a small, very sharp blade in his free hand. I'm going to have to cut, you understand? he said. I'm cutting into a vein to administer the antidote. Yes, yes, the Genovesan said, his words stumbling over each other. Cut the vein, I know this, just hurry. Malcolm glanced up at him, then back down to the arm. Deftly, he found a vein and cut into it with the small blade. Blood welled up immediately, and he nodded to a small square of linen that he had placed ready on the ground beside him. Wipe the blood away, please, Will. Will dropped to his knees to do so. As he cleared the wound, and in the seconds he had before blood welled up again, Malcolm quickly inserted a thin hollow tube into the cut vein. There was a bell-shaped end to the tube, and he poured some of the yellow liquid into it, watching it as it ran down the inside, tapping the tube until the liquid coalesced into a single mass, without air bubbles in it. He continued to hold the tube upright until the liquid ran down to the end that was inserted in Bakari's arm. Then, leaning forward, he put his lips to the bell-shaped opening and blew gently, forcing the antidote into the man's vein, where the blood flow would distribute it around his system. Deftly, Malcolm placed a linen pad over the small incision he had made in the man's arm, then bound it firmly in place with a bandage. Bakari's shoulders sagged in relief, and he looked up at the healer, bowing his head several times in gratitude. Thank you, thank you, he said. Malcolm shook his head contemptuously. I'm not doing it for you. I'm doing it because I can't stand by and watch another human being die. He looked at Will. You can tie this animal up again if you like. I'll do that, Horace said, stepping forward and picking up the thumb cuffs from where Will had dropped them. You give Malcolm a hand with Holt. Malcolm started to demur. He didn't really need any help. Then he saw the anxious look on Will's face and knew he would feel better if he were doing something to speed his mentor's recovery. He nodded briefly. Good idea. Bring my kit, would you? Kneeling beside Holt, he cleaned the end of the thin tube with a colourless, strong-smelling liquid he took from his satchel. Then he took Holt's arm from under the blankets and removed the bandage, exposing the site of the shallow wound. He used more of the pungent liquid to clean his small blade, then went to work administering the antidote to Holt. Throughout the process, there was no sound or reaction from the ranger, even when the blade cut into his arm. Will noticed that Malcolm used considerably more of the antidote liquid than he had used on Bakari. Poison's been in him longer than Bakari, Malcolm said, sensing his curiosity. He'll need more of the antidote. When he was done, Malcolm bandaged Holt's arm again. He looked up at Will, saw the anxiety in the young man's eyes, and smiled reassuringly. He'll be fine in a few hours, he said. All I have to do now is give him something to bring him awake again. The faster his system is working, the sooner the antidote will take effect. He prepared another compound and poured a little between Holt's lips. As the liquid trickled back into his throat, Holt swallowed reflexively and Malcolm nodded approval. He cleaned his instrument and rose to his feet, groaning slightly with the effort. I'm getting too old for this outdoor lark, he said. I need a camp with a few armchairs around the fire. Will hadn't moved. 
he was still on his knees beside Holt, leaning forward slightly, his eyes fixed on the bearded ranger's face, looking for any sign of recovery. Malcolm touched his shoulder gently. Come on, Will, he said. It'll be a few hours before there's any improvement. For now, you need food and rest. I don't want Holt to recover, only to find you've collapsed. Reluctantly, Will stood and followed Malcolm. Now that the healer mentioned it, he was ravenous, he realised, and bone tired. His range of training told him that it was always wise to rest and recuperate when the chance arose. But there was one task left to be done, he realised. Malcolm, he called, and the little healer turned, his eyebrows raised in a question. Before he could say anything, Will continued. Thank you. Thank you so much. Malcolm grinned and made a dismissing gesture with his hand. It's what I do, he said simply.